Welcome to today's FS Club webinar. I'm Zoe Buckingham, an international marketing consultant with a background in finance and technology. It's my pleasure to chair this event today entitled Two More Certainties in Life and How They Will Impact Financial Services, Growth in Compute Power and Commoditization. So it appears that there's death, there's taxes, that's two certainties in life, but there's also computing power and commoditization of the service that keeps pretty much everything running. Perhaps I can garden without computing power, but I can't order a new spade. So um, here we are today. Before we move on, I'd like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics and finance. And now I'd like to welcome our speakers. Welcome Peter Elgar, co-founder and CEO of Fourth Theorem, and Colin Thorne, Vice President of Platform Architecture at Renaissance Re. Peter's a serial technology entrepreneur who's founded Fourth Theorem, a company specializing in cloud architecture. Prior to this, he was the man behind successful companies within social advertising and digital transformation. He's an expert in data analytics and nuclear fusion research, and he's also a writer. Peter's latest book is AI as a Service. Colum started his career as a consultant working for Bearing Point before moving to reinsurance specialists Renaissance Re. He has years of experience working in serverless computing and has spoken at many events, including the AWS Summit in London only last week. There he talked about the implementation of serverless architecture. I'm sure that with such experts at the helm today, we're going to get a really good understanding of today's topic, the growth in computing power and commoditization that goes along with it. And um, finally, just some housekeeping notes. The slides are available to download in the chat and on the website. We'll be holding a 20 minute Q&A session after the presentation. So um, do look at the chat facility, the Q&A facility and send your questions through and I'll feed them into the conversation. OK, so without further ado, Peter and Colm, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, I just wanted to mention the polls, actually. We have two polls, don't we, Peter? Yes, indeed. Uh, if you want to go ahead with those, Zoe, please. Absolutely. Yes. So the first of these, how would you characterize your organization's cloud adoption? Um, so are you completely on premise? Um, are you planning a migration of some applications? Um, do you have major migration projects underway? Or do you have the majority of your applications and workloads running on the cloud already? Just need a few minutes for everyone to respond to that. OK, interesting. So 38 um, percent are already running on the cloud with the majority of their applications, but still some on premise activity. OK, thank you for that. Can we have our second poll? How would you characterize your organization's use of cloud native services? Not using the cloud. We primarily use infrastructure as a service. We're starting to use cloud native services. We're all in on serverless. OK, so serverless is quite strong, um, but some people aren't using the cloud for this purpose as yet. Great. OK, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Zoe. Uh, can let me just share my screen here? So uh, that that was an interesting uh, re response from that poll. So for some, we might be preaching to the choir, but uh, that's okay as well. Uh, so first of all, happy Star Wars Day, everybody. Um, so it's often said that there are only two certainties in life: uh, death and taxes. So myself and Colin today would like to talk about what we think are two more certainties and how they will continue to impact uh, financial services in the in the coming years. Uh, firstly, just a, a brief int introduction to uh, For Theorem. Um, so we are a consultancy that focuses specifically on next generation cloud architectures um, and uh, commodity cloud, a aka serverless on AWS. 
Um, and we do that at scale and help our clients like Renaissance Re build and design, architect, to build and deploy uh, modern uh, cloud applications and workloads. And we also do a lot of work in the transformation of legacy workloads uh, to modern cloud. Here's some books that we've written. And uh, here's also some open source projects that we've uh, published and continue to maintain for the community. Uh, please check those out and uh, hope you find them useful. So this talk is, is all about uh, growth in compute power, commoditization, and how that ultimately leads to serverless and why we think uh, that we're now moving to the world of true utility computing and that this trend is only going to continue. In fact, we'd go as far as to say that apart from a few special cases, all enterprise computing will ultimately become cloud native, uh, AKA serverless. And we hope to convince those of you that, that don't believe that, that, uh, that that may be the case. Uh, we're also gonna talk about how this can benefit you uh, with a real world example of uh, using this technology at significant scale uh, at Renaissance Re. So first, uh, beware the exponent. Uh, there's a story uh, that may be, uh, may not necessarily be true, it may be a bit of a legend, uh, that a traveling sage brought the game of chess to India. And the king of India was so impressed uh, with this game that he asked the sage to name his price. Sage said, well, it's very simple. All I'd like is a grain of rice on the first square, two grains of rice on the second square, four on the next, and so on and so forth. Now, the king, thinking this was a, a paltry price to pay, just said, fine, I'll get my accountants to sort that out for you. Once they started computing it, they soon realized that on square 20, it's a million grains of rice. On square 40, it's a billion. And by the time you get to square 64, you'd need 210 billion tons of rice. Now, the story goes that the mage uh, didn't get his reward, uh, that the king just executed him uh, for his insolence. So beware the exponent, uh, indeed. But of course, the point is that uh, as human beings, we don't really deal or understand uh, exponential progression very well. Uh, we think more, more linearly. But of course, we've been living for the last 50 years or so under, uh, certainly in the technology sector, uh, under an exponential progression, which is Moore's law. And that being that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit will double roughly every two years. And over the last 50 years, that's an improvement factor of approximately 2 billion, which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, to be honest. So, but rumors of his death have been around for, for quite a while. Indeed, even uh, Gordon Moore himself, uh, which is the quote at the top, thought the original prediction would, would last for maybe 10 years and was very surprised that we were able to keep going for 50 years. And he's, he's correct, it is amazing, but at some, but some time it has to stop. Uh, you can't have that expo exponent forever. But um, I'd like to point to some numbers. Uh, so today's best supercomputers executed about 10 to the 17 flops and have about four petabytes of memory. Uh, our brains, this is an estimate, can execute at about 10 to the 15 flops and have about 100 terabytes of working memory. So it looks like supercomputers have outpaced the human brain in terms of raw computational power until you consider that uh, the brain uses only 20 watts of power, so that's a banana a day, uh, and weighs only 3.5 pounds compared to a modern supercomputer that uses about 28 megawatts of power and occupies 396 racks. So my, my point here really is that uh, whilst we've seen phenomenal growth uh, along that vector, that there's a lot more that can be done and the proof is in our own heads uh, because we can see what the, the human brain can do with much less resources. Imagine what you could do with 396 racks of brain uh, so whilst it's true, I think that in its original form, Moore's law is stalled out because we're reaching physics limits, we will continue to see growth in compute power. And that will come through innovation in around GPUs, MPUs, TPU, system on chip, multi-core, optical and quantum, and so on. So we may see more step changes in the future as new architectural paradigms are introdu introduced, but I think we will see uh, continued growth. So certainty number one, is really that the ability to process information at speed and lower cost is very valuable to us as a species. And barring some kind of extinction event, that growth in compute power will continue. It's just too valuable to us to stop uh, improving our systems. So let's talk about the, the second force, which is commoditization. So uh, this is two toasters. 
The toaster on the left is a commodity toaster that I can buy for maybe 10 or 15 pounds uh, on any high street. It'll make perfectly serviceable toast. The toaster on the right um, is a bespoke toaster uh, that was built um, from scratch. Uh, and if you haven't seen a, a, talk, a TED talk by Thomas Thwaites, uh, who, who built this toaster, really go check it out, it's very entertaining. And when I say built it from scratch, I mean that he actually smelted the iron ore to create the heating element and the body of the toaster, did the same with the copper ore to create the plug, uh, obtained a barrel of crude oil, uh, refined that and made his own plastic. And of course, when he plugged his toaster in, it flamed out and uh, didn't really make any toast. Um, but the point here, of course, is that the commoditized version is often faster, cheaper and better than trying to build things ourselves from scratch. So how does that look in terms of compute? So if we look back over the last uh, 20 or, or so years, uh, of the compute industry. Around the turn of the millennium, uh, the early 2000s, we were all racking uh, our own kit in data centers. So we cared about the hardware layer, the operating system layer, the runtime, application server, the, the entire stack soup to nuts. And I can certainly remember racking kit myself. As we move through towards the, the end of the first decade, um, around 2007, 2008, virtualization became a thing. And we were so some of that hardware layer became virtualized, but a lot of that virtualization was really done uh, on premise. So we still cared about a, a lot of the stack. But as cloud kicked off around 2007, we started to see the lower layers of the stack commoditize out. So the hardware layer, the virtualization layer, and the operating system layer largely became cloud managed. A lot of us then started running container-based workloads, maybe running our own uh, Kubernetes clusters on top of uh, infrastructure as a service, as a service uh, on one of the major clouds. But moving forward to the end of the last decade, we started to see those layers of the stack commoditizing out as well. So um, with the growth of like container services, we no longer have to manage our own, um, our own Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and things like uh, AWS Lambda and so on gave us function as a service. So now we've really gone up a, a much higher level of abstraction. The lower portions of stack have commoditized out. That trend is only continue as we march forward to more and more utility uh, computing, aka serverless. Uh, this is a count of, of services across the three major vendors. It's a little out of date. Apologies, I didn't get a chance to update it. Uh, but as you can see, there's a, there's a large number of available services over a number of vectors, including compute, data storage, network, AI, machine learning, and so on. I think AWS currently stands at around 250 available services. Um, let's take another example of commoditization then. If we look at AI and machine learning, um, the first perceptrons were around in the early 50s. And for a, for a time, there was a lot of research work done on custom neural networks and so on. Around about 2010, 2014, we crossed the threshold uh, where the amount of available compute power plus innovations in GPU development led to the ability to do deep learning at, uh, at higher scale. Um, and many of you will remember uh, systems like AlphaGo uh, who, who really led the charge on that. But it's only a short time from there to the availability of open source tooling. So TensorFlow was released around 2015. Um, and then to the first commoditized cloud service being launched in 2016 uh, to where we are today at 2022, where one could say we're nearly fully commoditized around AI and machine learning. Most cloud vendors have a portfolio of around 30 machine learning services that you can just call through an API. You don't need to be an expert in these things to do that. So 63 years in development, but eight years to commoditize. And if you're, if you're curious about what those services are, uh, then again, you can look across a number of different vectors um, on AI machine learning, and, and all of the vendors will provide you with services around image and video recommendation, uh, um, recognition, personalization and recommendations, um, text to speech and speech to text, chatbots, predictive analytics, natural language processing, and then also support for training and customizing your own models um, and developer support tools. This is a this is this graph is um, a graph of uh, product announcements from AWS versus time, uh, and I'm really suggesting that one might use this as a proxy indicator for the rate of commoditization on cloud. 
and I think we can all see that curve is uh, is going in a, a particular direction, and we might recognise in another exponent there in terms of uh, the the rate of commoditization of technology uh, to cloud. So certainty number two is that the uh, the continued growth uh, in compute power is inevitably inevitably going to drive and perhaps accelerate growth in commodity cloud services, and the serverless will become the de facto standard for pretty much all enterprise computing over the near term. Because of these two forces, the growth in compute power and commoditization drives the economic um, reality that it's just faster, cheaper, better to uh, adopt this computing paradigm. So I'm sure maybe some of you are thinking, well, serverless, isn't that just for APIs and web apps? Well, the answer is no, it's much more than that. And can you really do compute at scale with serverless? And the answer is yes, you can. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, Colm, uh, who's going to tell us uh, how to do that. Thank you very much, Peter. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay and see a slide with Renaissance 3 uh, on the top. So yeah, good morning, everyone. It's, it's uh, great to, to be here and have the opportunity to share some insights into some of the kind of really cool things we've been doing at, at Renaissance 3 with, with, with serverless. I'm, uh, as a reminder, my name's Colm, Colm Thorne, and I, I am VP of Platform Architecture at, at, at Renaissance 3, or Renry for short. So for those of you who haven't heard about Renry, we are in the reinsurance business. And I guess, given the makeup of this audience, that most of you have heard about reinsurance, but if not, it is the business of insuring insurance companies. So when we you know, insure our homes, our cars, our bikes, our businesses with a particular company, they typically offload some of their risk to companies like us. So at Renry, we, we sell reinsurance and we buy reinsurance. Effectively, we, we trade risk. We have been in business for 29 years. We employ 650 people in 11 global offices. I myself am based out of our Dublin office. Last year, we wrote almost $8 billion of gross written premium and managed $18 billion of capital. We are the leading standalone property and casualty reinsurer. So what, what, why have we been successful or what makes us good at what, what we do? Well, there are a bunch of things, but one of them is our ability to understand our, our portfolio of risk. And we do this using an internal capability known as our, our risk rollup. This involves running an internal risk model, which represents our view of risk over our portfolio of reinsurance deals and exposure. This is a high performance computing financial modeling workload. Each time we run it, we process up to 45 terabytes of data and produce around 600 gigs of raw output for analysis. Typically we run this two to three times uh, every day. We not only use it to monitor the, the development of our kind of existing portfolio, but we use it to understand how our portfolio might react to kind of various permutations around right what, what's happening in the market or what would happen if we if we made this strategic business decision it really is a, a key tool in how we in how we run our business another reason we've been successful is our ability to run the same risk model on an individual deal in an on demand in an on demand way and this workload is called our deal analytics workload and this enables our underwriters who are the decision makers and what reinsurance deals we write and which ones we don't. It enables them to kind of analyze and price a reinsurance deal in a near real time way. For example, while on the phone with a, a broker or with a client. And at peak times, we will support about a thousand of these executions per day. So kind of in summary, we've, we've two core financial modeling workloads. Our risk rollup has kind of very high data volume, but lower frequency. And our analytics have a high frequency and a lower data volume. Uh, both operate on the exact same code base with the same business logic. What you see here is a, a kind of a, a an infrastructure diagram that represents how we've how we've supported these capabilities to date. It's an on-prem infrastructure. I won't go into too much detail, but at the heart of it is a is a, a compute-based salary cluster with each node or server in that cluster having half a terabyte of RAM and 48 CPU cores. So pretty beefy, beefy machines. 
We have a Python web server for orchestration. We use RabbitMQ for messaging, Redis for state management, and we have a high powered SAN for inputs and outputs. All of this is on-prem and, and fully, fully supported by our internal, our internal kind of IT teams. And this infrastructure has served us kind of very well in the in the past. In fact, it supported some pretty significant business growth over the last five to ten years. But we know it won't support us in the direction we want to we want to bring the business uh, going forward. And why is that? Well, the primary reason is scale, right? So each time we run a risk rollup, it takes between eight to ten hours to run. We can't run them in parallel. We have to run them sequentially. So that gives us a maximum of two to three every day. So when I talked about that's how many we run, that's actually, that's a limit. That, that's as much as we can run. Our business ideally would want to run, at, 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 you know, at the moment, at least five to 10. Sometimes when we run kind of large portfolio rollups, it can impact the performance of a, a deal analytic workload. And this can cause frustration with our underwriters. So what tends to happen is our business users spend time kind of scheduling and prioritizing which workloads need to be run. And this just really isn't a good use good use of their time. We're also limited in, in our ability to support the portfolio growth the business have planned. And we can't deliver some of the new capabilities that the business wants that we know are going to produce even more data volumes without runtime starting to exceed kind of 10, 12 hours, which really starts to, to limit and impact the usefulness of the, of the capability. So what, what could we do about this? Well, we sat around the table and we started to think big. We started to imagine a solution that would give us a dramatic increase in performance. So dramatic reduction in overall run times. We're talking 60, 70, 80% is, is what we had visioned. We wanted consistent run times. We wanted better workload isolation between our portfolio rollups and our analytics. So we didn't have that, 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 that kind of um, that contention. We wanted to be able to support more executions more often for our business. And most importantly, we wanted to support the portfolio growth our business had planned and also be able to deliver these new capabilities that we feel are, are, are going to produce up to 15 times more uh, data volumes than we're, we're, we're doing today. So quite a significant uh, increase in, in, in growth. So with the, I guess with the, with the kind of power of, of partnership between ourselves and Fourth Theorem and by adopting a, a serverless first uh, kind of mindset, we built a solution that's illustrated by this uh, architecture diagram that can now support these workloads in a, in a fully serverless way. And I'll, I'll talk you through this and, you know, if there's folks that kind of aren't overly technical, just kind of bear with me a little bit and I'll, I'll, I'll talk through some of the core characteristics of this. But when you kick off a risk rollup or a deal analytic, this uh, step function is executed, which we've titled here the execution planner. And this step function is really kind of the brains of the workload. It figures out and creates an execution plan of modeling jobs that need to be run to fulfill the workload. And this execution plan is then stored in our job state cache, which is a, an AWS um, a Redis, a Redis service. Uh, each job is sent to a job stream and executed in one of two kind of AWS compute services, either a Lambda function or a Fargate modeling container. Now, both our Lambdas and our Fargate modeling containers will talk to S3, which is effectively our risk modeling data lake. Once a job is complete, it goes to another, it goes to another stream, which is our Kinesis stream, and triggers another, an, another Lambda function, which also has an important role. This Lambda function will figure out, right, based on the jobs that have just complete, what are the next jobs in the plan that, that, that I can start and execute? And it iterates like this until the Lambda has figured out that all jobs in the plan are complete. Now, two, two kind of core characteristics. One is, obviously, the execution plan is, is the brains, which I've described. But the other really interesting uh, characteristic about this architecture is that we're using two different AWS compute services for um, for, for our compute workloads. Uh, now, why is that? If you remember the kind of core characteristics of our workloads, so we have a risk rollup, which has a high data volume and a low frequency, and our deal analytics have high frequency and low data volume. It's important that we're rolling deal, analy deal analytic workloads as fast as possible. And for these, Lambda is perfect, right? We can spin up hundreds of Lambdas in seconds. 
for our risk roll-ups, we don't have to be as responsive in spinning up our infrastructure. And we know we're going to pump more data through our, uh, through our kind of risk roll-up workloads. So Fargate is a better, cheaper option for this. So this is a really good example where AWS are offering us kind of a variety of serverless compute options that we can match to our workloads. So basically allowing us to put round pegs in, in, in round holes. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, for each roll-up, we execute about 1.3 million modeling jobs uh, in 2,000 Fargate uh, containers or, or Lambda functions. Uh, so to Peter's point, I think this really reinforces that serverless is not just for web apps and APIs. It is for you know, a high-performance computing uh, financial modeling workload. We didn't. It wasn't all. It wasn't all easy. I guess when you're pushing the kind of the boundaries of innovation like like this, we we had challenges. We had to work through challenges. I won't I won't talk through all of these, but um, one which which has a, a good story is our, is our Fargate scaler. So we we had to build a custom kind of Fargate scaler to satisfy our our, our scaling needs, and the reason we had to do this was we found we were hitting some quotas with the AWS Fargate scaler in that it was at times slow to spin up uh, to spin up uh, containers and we had we had a workload kind of waiting around for those those containers to be spun up because we have knowledge of the execution plan up front we have an idea of how many containers we're going to need to execute the workload so using the Fargate API we were able to proactively spin up these uh, these containers and that meant we we at no point we are waiting during the the execution for for containers to spin up and that just means we are running the workload as fast as possible now what, what's really interesting about this is in probably in the last 12 months since we built this that aws have evolved the service to the point that if we were building this from scratch today we probably wouldn't have to do this because that's you know they've taken the feedback uh, from ourselves from the community and they've adopted the service to be able to solve for that problem so it gives us an opportunity going forward maybe to kind of take this out and simplify our architecture even further uh, the, the other challenges I won't talk to, but we, we did have to work through them and we'd, we, we'd create support for, from AWS in doing that. So where has this where has this left us? Well, from a business perspective, we are now delivering roll-ups in under an hour. So our fastest roll-up is running in 50 minutes. So this is a dramatic reduction in the eight to 10 hours in which it took on our, on our on-prem infrastructure. We've, we've removed the constraints and the number of runs as a result, so we can now do more and more often. And we have faster and more consistent deal analytics. So the architecture supports a better level of, of, of workload isolation, so our underwriters are not getting impacted by, by, by kind of high volume risk rollups. Our business are not spending time scheduling and prioritizing workloads. They're now working on activities that are gonna increase shareholder value, which is what we want. And due to the horizontal, horizontal scaling characteristics of the architecture, we're much better positioned to support uh, the future portfolio growth the business have planned and to deliver on, on these new capabilities that we know are gonna produce much, much larger data volumes. And from a technology perspective, we've, we've turned the dial. We think we've, we, we believe we've taken a big leap here. We've brought, you know, serverless solutions to high performance computing and financial modeling workloads. For us, this has allowed us to reduce our code base by about 70%. So 70% of our code base on-prem was on supporting infrastructure and non-differentiating layers of our stack. Right? This, this, this is huge for us. Code, code is a liability. It's not an asset. The, 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 you know, the less of it you have, the better. It has allowed us to reduce our total cost of ownership of the solution. And very importantly, has increased the agility of our development teams. So our development teams are now spending more time focusing on business capabilities and less time on, on under supporting underlying infrastructure. Paul, and, sorry to interrupt. Are you getting are you getting near to your last points? We, I we am, just want to yeah, over to Yeah, thank yeah, you. To wrap up. And uh, finally, by leveraging the AWS infrastructure and the investment they've made in making that more sustainable, we have lowered the carbon footprint of our, our organization by being able to turn off uh, our own on-prem, always on clusters. And finally, we are now, uh, we're now serverless first at Renry, or as we say, as serverless as possible ASAP. And, you know, based on our learnings from this journey and you know, based on our understanding of the power of serverless, this is something we will be applying to our long roadmap of 
capabilities that we'll be taking on over the coming uh, months and years. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. That was a really interesting talk from you both. And I think going into the case study element with Colin gave us a different perspective, which was really useful. Um, so we've had some great questions come in from the floor. Um, Clive Bullen asking, what's the risk of the cloud failing for some reason, e.g. being attacked, technical failure, etc.? Equally, will the providers of the cloud be able to exploit their power and bump up what they charge with no way of, avoid, of avoiding this? Um, perhaps that's a question for Peter. Yes, so sorry, the first, the first point again, Zoe, was? The first point was about how safe is the cloud, essentially, from cyber, from a oh. cyber security perspective. Again, this is another benefit of being on cloud, right, is that um, the they have teams of experts that focus purely on cyber security. Um, so I, I would say that, you, you know, they're able to employ world class experts um, in this area. And therefore, you should feel safer on cloud in terms of like cyber security risk than you would having to do all of that on premise. Because again, you, you don't necessarily have to configure your own IP firewalls and, and then buy, you know, network appliances that are going to work at layer seven as well. L literally, you plug in a service, so on AWS, it's called AWS WAF, if you're building an API, you can then just say, okay, I'd like to have that uh, web application firewall implement the OWASP top 10 plus a couple of other rules, and you're set up. And you know that they're good because it's being used by an entire community, community of other businesses that are, that are applying the same rules, and they that will get updated by that community as well. So I, I would argue that it's, it's actually safer in terms of cybersecurity being on cloud than it is on premise. The second one, um, yeah, it, it, it's unlikely. It, well, first of all, it's it, 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 like in, in terms of the, the kind of pricing, uh, we see the pricing just being driven down time and again uh, because of commoditization. Um, there is competition in the market. Uh, we, we focus entirely on AWS because we believe they're the, the, the best cloud vendor out there, but there is competition in the market. Um, and I would imagine most people here believe in free, mar <laughs> free markets that are attendees in this call. So, you know, that will continue to have a downward pressure uh, on the cost of compute. And, and of course, as systems improve and it becomes cheaper to run these things at scale, uh, I, I think it just puts downward pressure on, uh, on costs. Um, and how about you, Colin? Do you, do you feel that you, you would have other options if you weren't happy at some stage with AWS? Is it, are there enough providers providing similar kinds of services? Yeah, I, th I, I think there are. I think there's, you know, that's, that's a, it's a really interesting topic, that one. I mean, you have, you have Microsoft Azure and you have, and you have the Google Cloud Platform. I think there are other options. And I think some organizations adopt the strategy of being cloud agnostic and they want to maintain that uh, optionality. I think that comes with a cost uh, because it's, it's, it's a high cost to, mean, to be cloud agnostic. I think the, the view, my view and the view we take is you're, you, you pick one and go deep and you'll get the first, you'll get the full benefit of it. That's where you'll get the best return on your investment. Um, it is, it's a trade-off, it's a risk, and, you know, each organisation will look at it differently, uh, but that would be how I tend to see it. Thank you, Colin. Um, so we've had a question also from Bob McDowell. Do you think the current geopolitical issues and less confidence in globalisation will slow down commoditization of the services you presented, or are they largely irrelevant to the growth of the services which you presented? I think... <sighs> Well, barring the outbreak of something really <laughs> major, I, I think they're, they're, they're irrelevant, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, this is driven by the, the kind of, a lot of this growth is, is driven by the kind of European and, and US economies uh, who, are, who are continuing to innovate a pace in this space. Um, so barring destabilization in Europe, I think, it, which let, we all hope <laughs> doesn't come to pass. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we will continue to see growth, yeah. And all these services are, are backed up in multiple territories, aren't they? Oh, oh, indeed. I mean, you you have. Um, I, sorry, I've lost count of the number of regions that AWS support, but there there are. Uh, there's there's multiple regions uh, in in multiple territories. Um, so yes, everything is resilient. Um, 
uh, across the board. And again, if you're using a service, so there's uh, the, the classic storage service in AWS would be S3. Um, it's just a feature. You decide what level of backup redundancy that you want, and then you just use it. Um, and I don't have to worry about take drives like I used to have to worry about in the past or backups or any of that kind of stuff. It, it happens as a service. Great. And um, another question we've had is, um, how did you measure cost against the on-premise system? I guess that's a question for Colin. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And I, I think the short answer is we, we didn't. Um, and th the reason for that is we never felt like it was an apples to apples comparison, right? So if we, because of the level of kind of innovation here and reimagining we were taking on, it didn't make sense to, to compare it to our on-prem. If we were going to lift and shift exactly what we had on-prem to the cloud, I think that would be a good comparison. I think because we were reimagining, we decided to focus on more on, you know, what, what, what was our return on investment and this going to be in isolation rather than comparing it to, to on-prem. And that's a, a kind of much wider analysis that involves, right, you know, if, if we're freeing up our, if we're able to do more of these roll-ups more often, what does that mean for the business? How does that allow us to differentiate ourselves? If we're allowed to free up the development teams to focus more on capabilities, if, you know, all, all of these, all of these type of things, which can be hard to measure and hard to put a, put a number on. So you kind of look at it as if, right, is this going to, is this going to allow our business kind of make, make a leap? And I think ultimately the answer to that was, was yes. Yeah, I guess you've got to add in all sorts of organisational savings that you've made by being more efficient, and that's that's a big job, isn't it? Yeah, like hugely. I mean, over time, the makeups, the makeup of our teams will change, right? Because you'll have more developers just focused on capabilities, and you'll need less skills for uh, supporting the underlying infrastructure, right? And that's what we want to do. You want more people focused on business capabilities because as a technology-driven organisation, that's ultimately what we feel will help differentiate us. And um, so it's just more about where are people spending their time and how close to, 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 to kind of business value is that? Yeah, it's that whole time to value, time to value thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, I've got a question for you about AI. And because it, it's from what you were saying, there's, there's an awful lot of AI services that are now available as part of these sort of packages. But do you think that that could potentially lead to a kind of stifling of innovation because it's almost like the the winners have been kind of put on these platforms and then what what incentive is there for younger smaller companies to develop something new uh no, actually no um and and the reason is that it, it i think it has the opposite effect um it, it actually democratizes access to ai so if, if I wanted to, let's say I had an idea to build uh, some new model that would do inference in a particular area. Um, previously, as a start, say I was a startup company, I'm going to have to buy a ton of compute, right? With, with like a load of GPU boxes that I can go and train my models on. So initially I've got a, a capital outlay to do that, right? Um, not, and then I've got my team of data scientists I need to hire. I've got people who've got to manage all of that equipment and so on down the line um, if i do that on cloud i can still innovate but my cost base immediately i, I, I take out that uh, capital expenditure at the start so i'm really looking at uh, just operational costs and i can manage the operational costs very quickly i can spin up uh, i want a thousand gpus i want to do some training and spin it back down again so that can be managed very quickly so honestly um i, I think it has the opposite effect of of um driving uh, innovation and making innovation much easier it, i mean if you're looking at um work that is kind of step changing i don't know let's say you're looking at new new kind of neural architectures for for, for ai then that's already big budget anyway um you know almost government programs <laughs> do you know what i mean right so or, or that might come out of academia whereas um for, for people that just want to innovate around business ideas, I think it makes it actually much more accessible and cheaper and faster to do that. Great, thank you. Well, that's encouraging. It's good to hear that it's actually going to foster innovation. Um, Mark Cook has asked a question, probably best for Colin. Have you had to retrain your infrastructure team? So we 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 had at least at least pockets of our infrastructure team right so we still have we still have infrastructure to support other areas but yeah some of our 
kind of more traditional kind of infrastructure folks or um, kind of systems engineers are now kind of more focused on what we describe as like platform operations on the cloud. Um, so I think one of the th one of the things the cloud brings is a much uh, kind of grayer line between traditional development and infrastructure. So kind of we've we've introduced a team which we call platform ops platform ops that kind of sits in the middle there, and we did have to invest in upskilling them on the kind of cloud and AWS skills that, that, that they would need to be successful. So kind of short answer is yes. Uh, and we see that across the board. We to upskill a lot of our a lot of our teams in the in the AWS space. Yes. Okay. That that sounds interesting. And and organisationally, it's a different perspective for everybody, isn't it? I think it is. Yeah. Particularly for uh, for the, the development teams, but um, yeah, there's there's there needs to be an openness to change there because you know developing on the cloud using the cloud it's, it's a different mindset it's a different way of thinking and I, I think what you look for in our uh, in our staff is a kind of real openness to to adopt that and thankfully we we saw it uh, but yeah it is it is it, it, it is a change it's not it's not a dramatic change but it is a change yes indeed well that's what moves us all forwards isn't it well, what an insightful presentation we've had today. I'd like to thank our speakers, Peter and Colm, for explaining the benefits of cloud computing at a whole new level and a degree of complexity. And I think it's easier to see now why it's gaining moment, the momentum that it is. Um, thank you to our sponsors who are from such a wide range of different parts of the financial services sector and it's just great to see you all um, still supporting us and finally thanks to all of you for listening and providing your feedback and questions and, um, and we hope to see you again soon. You should now be able to see um, some of the interesting events that we've got coming up, um, they're all detailed on the FS Club website and as usual, you can see what a diverse range of topics we cover from buying and selling of cryptocurrencies to um, ISO, um, employee share schemes, and of course, the FS Club Spring Garden Party, which I'm very much looking forward to. And I hope Peter and Colm can be there to meet you all in person. So I'd like to thank you all for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.